welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast, brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities, ethically, rapidly, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Well, it's good to see you all again, my friends. Eric Mills here, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. When last we gathered, we started our discussion of the momentous events that occurred eight decades ago. Uh, and last time together, we discussed D-Day, the 6th of June, the launch of the Normandy invasion, that epic full tilt assault on Adolf Hitler's fortless Europa. Just nine days later, it was D-Day in the Pacific as the invasion of Saipan marked the opening of Operation Forager, in which U.S. forces would punch through the Marianas, advancing inexorably through the defenses of a weakening but still recalcitrant Japanese empire. In both theaters of the Two Ocean War, 80 years ago, this sweltering summer, the final act had begun. The American capture of the Mariana Islands in 1902 44 is often recognized as a decisive operation of the Pacific War. In the hard-fought Battle of Saipan, which ran, raged from 15 June to 9 July 1944, U.S. firepower in the Central Pacific was combining land, sea, and air elements to an improved degree, smashing through the entrenched Japanese defenses in the Marianas and setting the stage for inevitable victory in the Pacific. And here to discuss how that all unfolded, is the author of the highly recommended, if you haven't read it yet, article about Saipan in the June issue of Naval History, Seizing Saipan. And we're glad to welcome back to the podcast today, Chris Hemler, author of Delivering Destruction, American Firepower and Amphibious Assault from Tarawa to Iwo Jima. Chris, welcome back. It's great to see you. Hey, Eric. It's uh, great to be with you. I appreciate the invitation and uh, and excited to be here. Great. Well, as your article so uh, so well articulates, the um, the victory at Saipan it was a hard fall, and it was the defenses were extremely entrenched. Uh, it was a fight to the death for the defenders, um, to a very literal degree, largely. Um, the elements that had been gelling as we learned as we went in the Pacific were really finally coming together at this point in the Pacific War. And so, why don't we talk about those combined elements? You can talk about them one by one. I'll, I invite you to start. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Eric. So um, as you lay out, this is a combined operation uh, from, from front to start. And there's a word I use um, not as much in the article, but throughout the book, Delivering Destruction, uh, the word trifibious, which is a clunky word. Uh, it doesn't roll off the tongue and we don't hear it often, but it's I think it's an important word when you discuss the Pacific War. And I think it's an, a, a woefully underused word. Uh, because we're so quick to call these operations amphibious, combining uh, combining land and sea, but these are truly trifibious operations, land, sea, and air. And each of these elements had a, a, achieved a, a very important degree of proficiency, particularly in their delivery of fires uh, throughout the Marianas operation. And it's really the synergy, I argue, of those three components and the specialists that are able to control and coordinate those land, sea, and air components and bring them to bear in, a, in an orchestrated manner uh, at Saipan, which really makes uh, the, the seizure of these islands even possible, right? I think we're all familiar with the story of, of the stories of the Marine grunts, uh, their courage ashore, and, and what an infantryman brings to battle. I think that's well captured uh, in the literature we have and, the, and, and kind of the general understanding of this war. What I think is less appreciated is the combination of firepower and the combination of land, sea, and air elements that enable that victory, that allow the infantrymen to seize uh, the, the, the territory ashore. Yes. Well, let's start with those grunts on the beach because it was a, that was, it was a hellish engagement, to be sure. So we should perhaps start there and then talk about how the air elements and the sea elements all come in together on that and how communications improve or improving at this point. Absolutely. Different elements. Absolutely. So as usual in the Pacific, the first 24 to 48 hours are, are, are really brutal 
for the Marines uh, attacking the beach, right? And, and, and they struggle at first to gain momentum. Uh, it's really about raising, uh, you, you know, um, strengthening the combat power they have on the beach, uh, which they don't, they don't start with much. And of course, the objective is to get as many troops, tanks, flamethrowers, artillery pieces ashore as quickly as possible in order to surge uh, the power that you have. Some of the advantages at Saipan are, are due to American supremacy, right? You mentioned in, in your opening comments just a moment ago how much um, the Americans have achieved by this point in the war. And I think it's always important to remind the listeners that this operation is happening as the Allies are attacking Normandy, right? This is literally nine days apart from D-Day in Europe, which is an absolutely astonishing uh, reality that the Americans and the Allies more generally can put 70,000 men ashore at Normandy on D-Day at the same time that they've got a 71,000 man assault force preparing to take Saipan. Uh, and that's what General Holland Smith will fight with at Saipan. He'll, it'll include the 2nd Marine Division, the 4th Marine Division, and the 27th Infantry Division of the U.S. Army. Uh, and some of the listeners will, will be familiar with uh, the dismissal of, of Army General Ralph Smith and some of the friction, the command and leadership friction there. Uh, but it's very important to understand that the Army and Marine Corps are cooperating here as they are with the Navy to achieve this victory. And I think that captures uh, the, the trifibious uh, the trifibious piece of this battle. One of the things you always worry about in these scenarios is the stove piping um, that can inadvertently occur. You don't realize how how not coordinated you are between each other until it's kind of already happening and you're not. Um, uh, we're starting to sort of figure that out by this point. Let's maybe talk in some detail about that. That's right. So the, the, the Marines have learned quite a bit by this point in the war. They, they've fought at Guadalcanal. The, the 5th Amphibious Corps in particular has fought most recently at Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands and then advanced through the Marshall Islands. And so they've really, as you suggest, improved uh, their coordination across elements. They've improved their communications uh, down to the tactical radio sets are much more survivable during an, an amphibious landing, much more efficient to set up and operate in battle. Um, they've also improved the, the proximity of shore. They've learned to put the right representatives in the right places in order to bring this combat power together. Uh, and so the shore fire control parties that include the naval gunfire liaison officers reaching out to the ships and, and bringing this naval destruction to the shores, they've learned where to put them and, and how to resource them. Uh, and, and by the way, they've, they've increased the number of, of liaison officers they have ashore uh, significantly. They've also begun to pull together the senior representatives of these communities. One thing the Fifth Corps does at Saipan for the first time in the Pacific, it brings together the senior artillery officer, the senior naval gunfire officer, and the senior uh, aviation officer. They bring them into the command post ashore in order to help them hash out decisions over fire support in real time while the battle is unfolding. They're bringing that authority and knowledge and expertise together to engineer the right firepower uh, solution for a given target, which might be any of those three elements. Uh, and so that's an important um, step forward in proximity and, and coordination ashore. And then maybe the final thing I'll mention is, is a theme throughout my book, the, the, the Joint Assault Signal Company becomes really the primary organization that helps bring these trifibious components together. Uh, the JASCO was created in 1943 in order to foster better integration, uh, trust, communication between these disparate elements uh, as they try to fight together. And so the JASCO will supervise at the same time the air support liaison parties, as well as the shore fire control parties. But those JASCOs will be integrated within the infantry divisions such that they can provide the right support at the right time. Uh, and that really pays dividends at Saipan in the delivery of fires. Yeah, I think back to our coverage of uh, Tarawa some issues ago and how far that uh, we've come by this point in 44 in terms of like getting these things right and coordinating these elements right and knowing what to expect. Um, all these sort of things, you can see how they're really coalescing by the middle of 1944. 
Let's speak a minute, though, about the, the enemy, the defenders of Saipan, because um, they will fight uh, pretty much virtually to the last man um, in, in spirit, if not in actual body um, on the ground. So let's give the, the viewers, listeners, a sense of the scale of what our forces were facing in terms of cracking through this. Yeah, so as is typical by this point in the war, the Japanese are going to fight with, with determination and grit throughout the battle. Uh, this will be the hardest target that the 5th Amphibious Corps has faced yet in the war. Uh, that's both because of, because of a resolute Japanese garrison under Lieutenant General Saito, the ranking commander ashore. Uh, it's also because of the terrain at, at, at Saipan. And the Japanese will use increasingly, to increasing effect, they will use their terrain at places like Saipan and Peleliu and Iwo Jima uh, to really remarkable degrees of proficiency in order in integrating their defensive lines with the terrain that the Marines are going to have to cross. And that's a really important theme at Saipan as well. So the Japanese, uh, you know, the Americans initially believe the Japanese detachment is around 15,000 troops. It's actually closer to 30,000. And, and so Saito has uh, a sizable detachment ashore, and they're well dug into successive defensive lines across the island. The pure size of Saipan is another challenge to the 5th Amphibious Corps. It's almost 14 square miles total, which, um, which really dwarfs uh, the earlier objectives that, that the Marines had faced, particularly the 5th Amphibious Corps. When we talk about places like Basio in the Tarawa Atoll uh, and Roy Namur in the Marshalls, we're talking about islands less than one square mile uh, in size. And here at Saipan, the Marines will take a 14 square mile uh, target. Uh, the terrain, as, as I mentioned, is, is really daunting. Uh, there's a difficult central highlands uh, there's dense sugarcane throughout the island where the Japanese will place uh, isolated snipers. Uh, and it's just a, it, it's rocky uh, and, and difficult. Uh, and it certainly suggests the battles to come in places like Iwo Jima and Okinawa in 1945. Yes, indeed. Well, let's talk about the um, air power aspect of all of this and how the air elements come into play in the ultimate victory. Right. So um, Admiral Mark Mitcher, commanding Task Force 58, will be in support of, of the operation here in the Marianas. And unlike uh, previous attacks where that air support had, had been uh, re really out of sync with the rest of the landing, uh, Mitcher's air support will be responsive. Uh, it'll be on time and it'll be dependable throughout the operation, not only because the carrier squadrons themselves are learning, but because of that integration that the JASCOs deliver ashore, and particularly their air liaison parties that are operating uh, within the infantry divisions at Saipan. So uh, Mitcher's got 15 carriers at his disposal, amounting to some 1,200 planes uh, when the operation begins. Now, not all of those, uh, of course, will spend the entire campaign here, uh, but they, they've got that at their disposal at D-Day. And the aircraft are particularly effective uh, during the initial landings. When, if you remember, at Tarawa, uh, the air support had been entirely out of sync. Uh, you know, really 30, 45, even 60 minute delays uh, during the initial landings. And the Marines are wondering where that aviation cover is uh, at really critical moments in, in, the, in the operation. Uh, yeah, very soon they own the skies, and that is a, um, a key factor in all this. What about naval support otherwise? So um, the, the naval support is, uh, is absolutely astonishing. Uh, some of the figures that I cite in, in, in the article are, are really uh, quite breathtaking. Uh, you'll, you'll have a, a range of battleships supporting the operation. In all, the Americans will have 66 warships uh, providing some type of naval gunfire support during uh, the attack at Saipan. And as I mentioned in the article, battleships Tennessee and Colorado each fire more than 1.2 million pounds of ordnance during the attack at Saipan, which uh, again is just breathtaking. It's amazing to think about. Um, I think whenever you look at the Pacific War or actually World War II in general, the scale of it is kind of hard for modern um, students of history to get their head around. Um, it, I, it's hard to envision an American war effort or an international allied war effort on this kind of massive 
logistical and manpower and firepower scale. Um, just the footage you see from around this time of the Liberty ships and all the other ships rolling off the, you know, the, the shipyards in the U.S. just cranking it out. Literally the arsenal of democracy. It's, it's hard to imagine um, something of that scale again. But um, you really see it when you look at uh, the June, July 44 and how it's all coming together. And either one of these would have been an epic blowout in itself of the century. And you have one right after the other, essentially simultaneously. Uh, that's just it's almost it's just phenomenal to think about. Um, I think that's exactly right, Eric. Uh, and not just students of the war, but I think scholars uh, and authors of the war, uh, you know, uh, still struggle to understand um, how the Americans and the Allies brought together these resources literally around the world, um, not just in one theater, but in two major theaters. Um, it really is impressive. So what follows after the success at Saipan? It's, it's barely time to catch one's breath and it's time to move on forward. Let's uh, sort of preview what happens in the ensuing weeks and months after that. Yeah, so the 5th Amphibious Corps will, will have some uh, some time off if, if it can be considered time off, but they won't fight again until um, the fight for Iwo Jima in, in February of 1945. Uh, of, of course, a separate outfit will attack at Peleliu, uh, an objective that is uh, controversial in retrospect and perhaps unnecessary uh, for the, the Americans' advance across the Pacific. But the 5th Amphibious Corps will take many of these lessons that we just discussed, the proximity of personnel, uh, more efficient and reliable communications uh, and radio channels, and, and that, that importance of trust understanding what each component is able to bring to the battlefield and learning to harness that synergy of trifibious operations. The fifth Corps will take all of those lessons into, uh, into its attack at Iwo Jima. Uh, and it'll need each of those lessons because as, uh, as the Americans are learning, so are the Japanese and general Tadamichi Kurabayashi will be arguably the greatest defensive commander of the war for the Japanese. And, and he will present an, an, an a, a, very, very difficult uh, target uh, in the Bonin Islands for, for the Marines to take next. It seems like for each step they advance, there's more huge hurdles ahead all the way to the finish line. Right. Well, Saipan is on such a, as we said, this epic scale. It's the D-Day of the Pacific at the same time as the much vaunted D-Day in Europe. It seems to be overlooked a little bit by history, um, at least in the popular mind. Um, I invite you to opine on what that could possibly be a result of. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I suggest as much in the article. I, I think the first the, the first um, the first reason is one that we've already mentioned, right? Which is it, it's just for it, it's just overshadowed by the landings in Normandy, both in scale and in in, in anticipation because the Allies had been planning uh, to cross the English Channel for some time. Uh, and of course, everyone's attention is, is fixed on, on that, uh, that particular operation. So the, the, the single answer is, is uh, Europe's D-Day overshadows the landing in Saipan. I think um, you know, another unfortunate reason is that the, the controversy that, that I've mentioned, the, the dismissal of Ralph Smith uh, under Marine General Holland Smith, uh, becomes kind of a uh, an unfortunate publicity affair between the Army and the Marine Corps, and and and, and that'll play itself out in the papers and in the service uh, cooperation or, or lack thereof, perhaps. Uh, and 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 so I, I think there's just uh, some competing narratives here that unfortunately take away from the achievement, a uh, really important achievement, of securing the Marianas, uh, a, a truly critical objective and a checkpoint in the war. Not only does the victory at Saipan give the Americans their step forward in puncturing the Japanese inner perimeter, it leads to the dismissal of an entire Japanese uh, of, an, of a Japanese prime minister and his entire cabinet. Uh, it places B-29s within range, uh, within striking range of Tokyo, which is an incredibly important step forward. And it gives the U.S. Navy an important anchorage uh, in the Central Pacific. A, a, for, a, a forward operating base now uh, to take both surface uh, and undersea vessels forward. 
in uh, against the enemy. And so these are really important achievements, and yet they're overshadowed by uh, some service uh, infighting and and certainly the important events unfolding in Europe. Yeah, I think you uh, zeroed in on what's a, a twofold answer to the question. Having overshadowed by the events in Normandy, one can understand. Um, it's a shame, though, that the biggest takeaway from what's going on in the Pacific, the media talking point, to use a more modern phrase, becomes that um, conflict between the Marines and Army Command. And, and that becomes the story, uh, right. which is ironic when it's considering how you, you point out so well that uh, actually this is a um, casebook example of increased, improved coordination of various elements. That's what's the uh, recipe for victory here. Yet what comes out of it is the sense that there's uh, not working across purposes or somewhat, which is completely the opposite of the true story, which I feel like was missed at the time. That's right. Well, this is not an applied history article, but we live in the world we live in now. So um, you can't help but want to speculate when you look at these lessons from the past and how they apply to now. Um, the positive elements of the victory at Saipan, how would you see them as important takeaways for people looking at the current geopolitical situation uh, in the Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific particularly? It's a great question. Um, I, you know, as I look at the mass, the, the the logistical supremacy, the material supremacy that the Allies are able to deliver to the Marianas. Uh, I can't help but see an applied lesson in that uh, even with material supremacy, the Americans needed human solutions on the battlefield, uh, artful solutions on the battlefield, not scientific solutions. And as I argue in the book, firepower coordination is, is a human art. Uh, it's not a science and it's not a simple equation. Uh, and so it really took human solutions on the battlefield. The JASCO troops that I described, the air liaison officers and naval gunfire officers, the gunners at sea, the aviators in the air. It took human solutions to collaborate together, to orchestrate this combat power, to put it in stride and to apply it at the right moments in battle and against the right weaknesses in, in, in the enemy armor. And so I, I think the lesson there is that material supremacy certainly helps. I, I, I certainly want to show up to the battlefield uh, with more ammunition than my opponent, but that is not enough in and of itself. And so uh, we still need human solution, human solutions, excuse me, um, in order to blend this material power uh, or technological power into uh, into practical victories. Well, where do you think we stand at the moment if something were to hit the fan, so to speak, in the next couple of years in that corner of the world? Where do we stand at the moment as far as being able to rise to that occasion as we did in 1944? Well, historians predicting the future is uh, is a dangerous game, but I, yes, I would I say know, that <laughs> I, I would say that you know my own research on the Pacific War tells me that we have lessons yet to learn. Uh, and the technology that we've been developing in peace, whether that's artificial intelligence, whether that's uh, an unmanned drone or surface vessel, um, whether that's a communications infrastructure uh, and, and a data link, these are all going to be very important parts uh, of victory in the future. And yet we don't know what gaps they will introduce, uh, what silos will exist and what we don't understand about these capabilities coming together. And that's what I would argue are the early lessons for the 5th Amphibious Corps in the Pacific. At places like Guadalcanal and Tarawa, the Marines are struggling to understand how these pieces fit together and how, that, how they can fight efficiently and effectively with something as new as, as air, close air support uh, that isn't more than a few decades old and had only been practiced in theory and at peace at least for the Americans, until 1941 uh, and really 1942 when offensive operations begin. So I, I think those are the, the concerns that I would see and the things that I would want to learn. Where will those capabilities bump into one another? Where will they compete with one another? 
Uh, and how can we build a common and accurate picture of the battlefield in order to make the right tactical decisions as the battle unfolds? Because that's really what the 5th Amphibious Corps is learning to do throughout 1943 and 1944 in its advance across the Pacific. In a, a near future scenario, it seems like the first 12 to 24 hours are going to be huge in terms of finding out where those gaps are, you know, mm -hmm. where the silos are. Uh, would you agree? I, I would. Uh, the, the pace is absolute, it, it is concerning and will be rapid. And yet um, adapting to those conditions will always be important, not only for the United States, but for its competitor. Uh, adaptation is, is a, uh, an age old aspect of conflict and uh, will remain so despite uh, despite the technological uh, progress. It's almost like the larger question is, how do you train them to be able to adapt when th things are happening in real time? Um, you can only do so much preparation. You can train all the sort of known knowns, but there's, there's unknowns you refer to that, uh, well, you can only know them once they happen, I suppose, but. Uh, that's right. And so, you know, training toward skills less than uh, less than than solutions, I think, is important. Uh, and, and so building flexible mindsets and, and, and skills in critical thinking and uh, and, and collaborative um, engineering. Th these are things that, 